<laughs> now, what were you doing in North Carolina? Well, I was coming up from Pensacola. Uh -huh. Pensacola is in Florida. Okay. See, that was your first stop. Second stop was Pennsylvania. And, uh, <laughs> men's get gas, but oh my gosh, they charged me something like 50 cents a gallon. That was all I'd heard of. Anyway, I managed to get up to, uh, Morrisville, where we live right outside of, and, uh, talked to some crop, to some crop dusters there. They said, boy, we'd love to fly that, or buy that plane off you. I said, I'll sell it to you on one condition. You let me fly it and do crop dusting. They said, that's fine. So the first thing we did, we took that 220 horsepower out, went and wore surplus again, like brand new Pratt & Whitney 450s with a starter. So he pushed the motor, the motor mounts back about three or four inches, compensate for the heavier engine, put that in. Man, I had to go on plane. We used to do all kinds of crazy stunts with that plane, I'll tell you. There's three of us had Stearmans. They said I was the wackiest. <laughs> but, oh, man. I think one of the... Want me to keep on going on this now? Yeah, yeah. And I want one to of the this. craziest things, I think, is I had a friend. It was just after World War II now. And uh, they were finally getting my uh, cars. There was one you could buy. It was a Chevy convertible. Maroon. And one of the farmer's sons managed to get a Chevy convertible. And he was at the end of this field when I was crop dusting. This car with the top down with his girlfriend watched me crop dust. So I thought, why don't I change the color of that car? So I went underneath the telephone wires at the end of the field, which were Johnny about. 20 feet off the ground, and that tail up there is probably 15 feet, so it was very, very tight. I went over top of the car with the hopper wide open. I made a turn, the car was white. <laughs> no longer maroon, it was white. So I followed down the road and about five miles, the dust was still coming out of that car. Needless to say, I didn't go back to the airport that night. <laughs> yeah, I did last those suckers, I'll tell you. But I had a lot of fun drop dusting. I had a lot of interesting. In fact, I was the first pilot in Pennsylvania to get DDT poisoning because we had an open hopper where the front cockpit should have been. Mm -hmm. It was generally, you know, two cockpits, forward and aft. You had dual controls. You take all that stuff out, put it in the hopper. But again, it wasn't airtight. So there was always dust, you know, flying up there. And I remember I was, I was crop dusting tomatoes. I was feeling a little woozy. So I remember landing. That's the last I remember. Had a buddy there seeing something was the matter. I went right on by the truck. I was supposed to get more DDT. He jumped up the wing and cut the engine. They pulled me out, take me to the hospital. Three days later, I came out of the hospital. They had to really pump me out. Man, I was really deloused, I'll tell you. But I was the first one from then on the FAA which never caught up to me on the license, said that you're supposed to have a commercial license, that's by the way. And I, I just had a regular uh, license. I never checked on it. Because uh, regulations were very lax way back then. Sure. And uh, <laughs> now, Didn't you fly to Newfoundland? Yeah. Newfoundland, yeah. Newfoundland, yeah. So tell me that story. Well, in our hometown had a uh, substitute minister, and he's come to the, the Methodist church I was in, and uh, he had three daughters. Two of the daughters lived in Falsington. In fact, Pingator married one of the daughters who was on the, the flying service, flying field and service. And uh, <laughs> the other daughter married a guy and lived up in Long Island. Well, I got to know the daughter real good and really became real good friends. So I used to take off from uh, Marsville, that little airfield, to see before I had the Stearman. And I flapped to Long Island. Well, you have to go over to New York City and I get my bearings from there, figure out how to go out to the island. She did have a uh, compass. 
that thing. So you take a rough reading, <laughs> figure a proxy where you're going, and uh, go out there. Well, <coughs> I didn't know it at the time, but uh, this Nancy's folks were very well to do. They had a beautiful home up there in uh, Long Island. And in fact, the maid's quarters was bigger than our house in Flossington. The house of Flossington was about, I guess, 2,000 square feet, somewhere around there. So, I mean, that house is a real mansion. Anyway, I got talking to the father, and the father says, how would you like to start learning how to fly a twin-engine plane? I said, man, I love it. He says, well, he says, I'll have to get you a commercial license. So I went down there, took a written test, went out and had a check ride with this guy for about an hour. He wrote out and says, here. He was supposed to have a lot more instruction than that, but again, it was kind of paid under the table by Mr. Patty. So anyway, first thing I know, he buys a brand new twin-engine Cessna. And we said he liked to go up to Nova Scotia. And uh, that was up in uh, Canada. And in fact, he was out over the Atlantic Ocean. It was an island, actually, out off of Canada. So we go up to Watertown, get our papers for going out of the country, and fly up to Nova Scotia. Well, I didn't think nothing of it. I was just so happy flying a twin-engine plane. What can I say? So, <laughs> we used to take people back to the United States. They had, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? passports and all that. We always went through customs in uh, Watertown, New York. Oh, wait, so you'd, you'd fly to Nova Scotia? Yeah. You'd pick people up? Yeah, they had a, they had a hunting ride, lodge okay. out in Nova Scotia. Oh, God, it was beautiful. Absolutely. You couldn't believe how pretty it was. Had an airfield right alongside the lodge. Yeah. So, man, I was in ninth heaven. Okay. And you'd pick people up and bring them back? Yeah. All right. And uh, there's always somebody with me. From the family, it was either Mr. Patty or one of his associates. Well, that went on for about, oh, I guess, six months. Yeah, it was the better part of a year. And when I was in high school at the time, and all of a sudden, I'm in class, and two guys come, one on either side of me, says, come with me, Sonny. They actually picked me up. Drag me head down the hallway to the principal's office and start really laying questions at me. Who am I picking up in Canada? Who am I being across the border? Do I know who these people are? She says, yeah, they're friends of Mr. Patty. She says, well, that's what they were afraid of. Here, Mr. Patty was actually a fence for stolen money through the mafia into Wall Street. That's how he was doing it. And we were picking up illegal aliens from Nova Scotia to bring them to the United States. I didn't know it. I mean, when the immigration was there, I thought they were after me because we put bottles of, uh, oh, well, I forget what it was, this special kind of booze they had in Canada. It was a lot cheaper to buy it there than being it across. Actually, you weren't, you weren't supposed to do that, but we put them up on the wings, you know, inspection ports. And fly them in. Boy, that was good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was flying high. But anyway, two immigration guys come. They take me down to Philadelphia. And uh, <laughs> ask me so many questions. I was down there a day and a half. Oh, boy, I was I was dragging like a map out of there. Where did your father stay? Neither of my parents ever found out. I never told them. Okay. In fact, my dad didn't even know I had a <laughs> fly license until way later on. <laughs> <coughs> so you were 16 when this happened? That's right. All right. <coughs> and by that time, I had a full instrument rating and everything, which was another sham, but that's beside the point. So whatever happened to Mr. Patty? Nothing. Paid off the right officials. That was all. But boy, they sure scrambled on me for a long while. But uh, I had to go to all kinds of hearings and everything. They got a hold of some of these guys. They wanted to know, this guy in the airplane, 
I says, yeah. I said, yes, he was in the airplane. I said, he had his papers and everything. How am I supposed to know? Because I was just happy to fly. So, that's how I, <laughs> that's how I learned how to fly a twin-engine plane and go up to Canada. Next question. Okay. Tell me uh, the attributes of um, what your father was like and what your mother was like. Okay. My father was the youngest son of my parents. In fact, they were over 40 and he was born. So he didn't have much of a childhood. Uh, his parents were there already fairly old. And uh, I know they both worked on a farm for a while. And uh, you could never get close to them because they are always busy. Like his mother was milking the cow one time. He went over and talked to her and she whacked him on right across the side of the face and said, don't bother me while I'm working. So he never really had much growing up on that. When my dad went to work. He only had one other job besides the Pennsylvania Railroad. And I forget what it was, but he started as a yard man, working on the tracks and so on. Worked his way up to an uh, engineer who runs the train. And uh, he only had a third grade education. Because then uh, you, you were too busy having your kids work. You didn't have no time for them to get an education.